Now, today we're honoured to have Neil Stegason here. Uh, his latest role is Chairman of the European Fiscal Board, which is probably even less known than the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council, <laughs> partly because it's only set up last October, and he will refer to the board uh, to some extent in his talk. But he goes back a long way to being a member of the Delore uh, Committee on Economic and Monetary Union back in 1988-1989. So he has a long record on Economic and Monetary Union. And he's been chairman of the Danish Economic Council, advisor to the governor of the uh, Danish Central Bank. And he is Professor Emeritus of International Economics at the University of Copenhagen. So he has a uh, a great track record there. His uh, speech today is on the future of the euro area and uh, how we can make the uh, euro more euro area more robust. Um, so I have great pleasure in introducing him, and I've suggested to him that he might start uh, with just a little anecdote from uh, a discussion with the taxi driver this morning, which I find quite extraordinary uh, in Dublin, uh, but it's worth repeating in uh, this group. So over to you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Michael, and for your hospitality here, and, and this morning indeed uh, with the Irish uh, Fiscal Advisory Council. I arrived at that uh, meeting uh, with a taxi driver uh, who did know what the uh, Economic. He, you know, he didn't know the council, no. He knew he the right, yeah. uh, SV, the Economic and Social Research Institute. He knew that. Um, and he said, well, where are you going? Are you an economist? He said, he said, this country ought to be run by economists. It is not. It's run by school teachers. <laughs> it should be given over to the economists. <laughs> we are having problems again, and, and they don't seem to learn. Uh, prices are going up. Uh, House prices are going up. My rent is going up all the time. So um, uh, I was quite impressed by that coming. He said, I, I know nothing, of course. He said, I know nothing. But, but he, he also he, said, to Niels, you must be a genius if you're yeah. an economist. You must be a genius. <laughs> there you are. And when I told I was going also to the Ministry of Finance, he almost bowed. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's some support for economists, at least, in this uh, country, I can see. But thank you very much for the invitation. Um, when I got the invitation, I thought this would be optimal timing, uh, late May, because there would be a lot of things to comment on, both uh, um, European semester, this complex process that uh, the European Union goes through twice a year with detailed submissions by countries that are then evaluated and criticized and so on. There would be a lot to talk about then. Um, the Commission had announced it would pu publish a so-called deepening EMU paper uh, in May. That now turns out to be only the 31st of May, and I learned that this other, the Commission's comments on individual country positions uh, in the current round uh, was only published this morning, so I don't know about really what is in there. So I won't be that uh, topical. Uh, another factor that I couldn't quite foresee was that we have a new president in France that will create a new constellation of influences on the topic of how to move uh, uh, economic and monetary union forward and even to make it more robust. So there's always uh, something to talk about, even less so than one might have expected uh, some time ago. Um, the flagship uh, publication of the Commission on, on, uh, on Europe uh, by D.G. Ekfin, the Director General that deals with economics, is uh, the European economy. But the question, of course, is, uh, is there a European economy or are there still economies? Do we have to distinguish a bit more carefully all the time when we talk about developments uh, in Europe? There are some features that are common uh, to uh, European economies at this stage. There's a steady, slow recovery from the depths of the uh, low uh, in fact, double dip recession we had, uh, the last leg was in 2013. Um, and the word now uh, resilient about that uh, uh, upturn is, is becoming increasingly uh, used. Um, that is maybe a bit uh, overstating it. 
Uh, apart from Ireland and, and to some extent Spain, growth rates are still very moderate. They are a little bit faster than apparently the, at least the estimated uh, uh, rates of growth of potential uh, in, in our economies. Uh, so uh, uh, the slack degree of slack in our economies is no doubt being reduced and, and at a somewhat similar pace apart from the two countries I mentioned. Um, austerity is clearly uh, fading somewhat further into the past. Um, but this upswing has two uh, uh, unique features. It is underpinned by extraordinarily stimulative monetary policies from the European Central Bank uh, for now quite some time. Uh, and also in uh, some, uh, let's say, conversion uh, of fiscal policies from the uh, major corrections and consolidations in 2011 to 13. Since 2014, there has been a switch into a more neutral stance and some periods slightly expansionary stance in most European uh, countries. That is one feature of the economy. It's been stimulated by uh, policy changes, particularly in, in monetary policy. It's a strange recovery in a second sense. Uh, it is uh, one where the science that, as I said, uh, slack is being gradually eliminated, but there's little wage pressure, no signs of any uh, pickup in, in inflation of any size. And the uh, current account surplus of the euro area countries as a whole uh, is uh, sizable. It's uh, edging down slightly to toward 3%, which is historically high. And that is explained mainly by a shortfall in investment in all countries in, in Europe, more or less, uh, both public and private investment. So it is uh, maybe a resilient recovery, but it's a highly atypical uh, recovery. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of different interpretations that one can make of it, and, and thereby what one should do about it. Uh, some would say there's uh, an underestimate, there must be something wrong in this uh, calculation, the slack in our economy is, is surely greater than what is uh, uh, accounted for by the official statistics, the so-called output gap. Um, the second one says no, that is not really, it's just probably a reality. We are just in a period of much lower growth, uh, partly for demographic reasons, uh, partly for the reason that there has been a long period of, of low investment, so we cannot expect uh, growth to be uh, much faster than it is. And you can identify easily who are defenders of these positions. Uh, uh, I should mention first that the uh, ECB has been a defender of uh, looking more broadly at the measures of slack in our economies. Uh, they have difficulties understanding why it's so difficult for them to get inflation up towards the 2% or just below 2% that they have indicated. Um, and already in, in 2014, uh, President Draghi uh, was in fact the first senior policy official to claim that uh, uh, monetary policy needed some relief from other forms of policies, notably fiscal policy. Uh, um. <clears throat> Yet there are, there are further puzzles because uh, unemployment in some of the central countries in the uh, uh, <coughs> In the Euro area, in, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in Germany, unemployment is now below 4%, in the Netherlands, below 5%. There's still no uh, wage uh, pressures. Uh, we can look at uh, participation rates in some of these countries. Is, is there some reserve uh, labor waiting to join the labor force that keeps the downward pressure on, on labor? I will not uh, discuss this in, in, in detail. There's quite a bit of no doubt, um, involuntary part-time unemployment that could be mobilized. But on the whole, I mean, the uh, uh, ECB and, and uh, the uh, strong currency countries such as Germany and the Netherlands uh, say we are already uh, close to having eliminated uh, the slack. And therefore, the emphasis now should be on uh, not doing much on demand without doing at the same time more effort in, form of, in the form of reforms. Uh, to improve our productive capacity. Um, that should have been done maybe for quite some time ago. The weaker countries, uh, uh, let me be more specific, uh, Italy, uh, Portugal, France, to some extent Spain, uh, believe that there's a need for more stimulus on the fiscal side in particular. And they stress uh, 
the uh, underestimation of the slack in their economies uh, that the Commission is relying on. There was recently a letter from the four finance ministers of the four countries I mentioned to the Commission saying you must uh, revise your methodology. Um, this was a letter from earlier this month, so I don't quite know what the reaction is. But there's a surprising attention, in, uh, even at the highest political levels in the Eurogroup, in discussing this kind of fairly uh, technical issues. And here, clearly, more work needs to be done, both by Commission and national uh, officials. One could say that the former group, the stronger countries, uh, uh, they are more anxious to uh, be in a situation where they prevent or uh, make future crises more unlikely. Uh, and they think that times are already good enough to attempt some consolidation to prepare for that eventuality that's making it more robust in a sense. The Germans point not least to their experience in 2005 to 8 when Mrs. Merkel was elected for the first time and uh, took over uh, German economy on the upturn but with weak uh, public finances which has lasted ever since uh, <coughs> unification in the early 90s and she made uh, rather major consolidation between 2005 and 8 That enabled us to stimulate our economy without any major risks to it in 2009-10. Uh, she, uh, she might not enter into that kind of argument, but Mr. Schäuble and others in Germany would, would put it that way, uh, no doubt. Um, and that's why the, the Germans and, and the, the, the Dutch say, no, no, we don't need more stimulus uh, at this point. And we're even critical that the monetary policy of the ECB is becoming too expansionary. You may also have seen that um, uh, President Draghi, when he was in the Dutch parliament last week, I think it was, had a rough time with parliamentarians who said about the same things as a German. Uh, hold back now a little bit. The side effects of, of being so stimulative on monetary policy are now outweighing the, uh, uh, the benefits that we have from the stimulus. The weaker countries are more anxious to get out of the current crisis that they still feel they're in, the, not the crisis maybe, the, but the low growth trap they are in. Um, and they have had great difficulties. Uh, uh, they have used the, the, the benefits they have had from uh, the re some relaxation of the rules and from the uh, low interest rates that have saved them uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, money in, in borrowing costs for, for the public sector. They have used that somewhat defensively uh, uh, rather than uh, uh, by expanding their future capacity. Uh, they have not really uh, used their fiscal space uh, very well. Now, uh, uh, in the uh, most recent discussion, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Commission again relies on, on the presentation of the measures that some countries are really doing better than they were expected to do. Uh, Germany and the Netherlands both have so-called outperformed their own targets in terms of public finances. Not very massively, uh, but enough to uh, give some significant stimulus uh, if they wanted to. Um, but uh, uh, all of this uh, divergence in situations, of course, shows that uh, uh, it is uh, somewhat questionable to talk about the European economy. Uh, one still has to use, I think, uh, the plural, even in a period when growth rates are not too far apart. They start simply from very different uh, uh, points. So it's a bit of a dialogue of, of the deaf the overperformers uh, are uh, very critical of so-called the underperformers uh, and distrustful of the uh, role of the Commission that um, is supposed to be the independent monitor of, uh, of performance. Um, they are not as uh, bound by the rules as they should have been uh, uh, and they should be held more uh, responsible, accountable for maintaining the current system. They should become less political. That goes against uh, what Mr. Juncker has said when he was nominated. This is going to be a more political commission, he said. That, of course, raises a problem if you uh, want to have the uh, role also of being an independent uh, monitor, uh, relying primarily on economic uh, arguments. And that is no doubt one of the main reasons why uh, the European Fiscal Board also was set up uh, to tighten the uh, uh, economic uh, sense principles by which the Commission evaluates uh, countries. That's a tall order, 
uh, we'll see how we can uh, live up uh, to that. But that inspiration was already uh, around in the so-called Five Presidents Report from the five institutions, the uh, uh, European Parliament, the Eurogroup, the Council, the ECB, and the uh, Council of Ministers. Uh, that was uh, already here yeah, in, in 2015. It's not uh, very new. <clears throat> I think in order to go back to uh, why there is this divergence over the interpretation of uh, <coughs> fiscal, particular, fiscal policy in particular, one has to go back to uh, the Maastricht Treaty itself and the compromise that was struck in that uh, treaty, which is often labeled as faulty by most uh, observers. Uh, you centralized monetary policy, but you didn't centralize uh, fiscal policy. On the contrary, you left them almost entirely in national government hands. Um, and critics, not least from the US and the UK, are uh, very ready to say that um, uh, this is not a, a tenable position. If you don't have a well-functioning uh, integrated area that is truly one economy with mobility of capital and labor very well developed, then you need some kind of fiscal mechanisms to uh, make up for that deficiency. Um, to understand that, I think we, we have to look at uh, the treaty itself. There were certainly oversights in uh, Maastricht, uh, particularly on the financial side. That was totally underestimated. That was certainly the most serious defect in my, from my perspective. Uh, also the absence of any safeguards. Uh, but the fiscal framework was discussed very carefully. And uh, there was uh, agreement on the that there had to be some disciplinary role uh, for on fiscal policy now that countries were no longer on their own and could experience uh, currency crisis. Um, the uh, risk that they would uh, lose access to international financial markets uh, as a result of the principle of not bailing out individual governments was seen as a bit remote and, and therefore there had to be some rules of behavior for fiscal policy. Um, the Delors Committee, uh, which I had the honor to, uh, uh, which I had the honor to participate, um, there was some recognition that at times uh, there could be a need for also looking at the aggregate or collective stance of the euro area to see what, what is really the outcome of all these recommendations that we make on the size of budget deficits in individual nations. That would be necessary, it was also said, to uh, take part effectively in international cooperation in the G7 framework. Uh, somebody had to be able to say what fiscal policy is in the area as a whole, not just to refer to this is left still to national member states. So, um, but that principle was uh, left aside in, uh, in Maastricht. It was uh, seen as uh, a bit too vague. Uh, how can one stabilize a large area like the Euro, uh, Euro area? Uh, it's difficult enough to do it in individual countries. And, and the idea that through oversight, we can correct so how the sum of national policies is simply analytically too difficult. It will also be difficult, I think it was recognized at the time, to reconcile it with the national fiscal rules that were put in place. So the, the, the basic uh, bargain was a, a simpler one, uh, I think. Uh, um, Germany, for Germany, it was essential that they had the impression they finally were able to export their so-called stability culture to the rest of, of Europe, which they had failed to do in earlier arrangements, looser arrangements. For the French, to some extent for the Italians, it was essential to share monetary leadership with the Germans. There was a uh, constant irritation to particularly the French uh, that uh, Germany was uh, uh, the decisive factor, the Bundesbank was the decisive factor in monetary policy. But on the, uh, the, the, the fiscal side, they uh, uh, thought uh, the Germans said that uh, uh, they had designed uh, an appropriate uh, framework or helped to design that and got the others to accept it, one where the central bank was uh, oriented towards stability and, and, <clears throat> and was independent of political influences, and the fiscal rules were largely meant to maintain um, public uh, finance sustainability for long periods of time, not to la limit the ability of countries to stabilize their own economies, but precisely to leave them aside, recognizing that they would have different needs 
and that they should maintain a sufficient margin to the limits of action uh, so that they could stabilize through mainly automatic stabilizers in their fiscal policies, their own economies. So that was, uh, in a sense, the basic uh, compromise. Um, I think it was uh, also a compromise that many economists were involved in. It was not just a political compromise. Of course, it was uh, more or less what was politically feasible also at the same time. Um, the arguments uh, were made uh, on economic grounds as well, and if they had not been seen as a reasonable compromise and feasible um, also by, by the Germans, they would not have uh, been, uh, EMU would not have, have happened. Um, and that, that's, I think, these uh, ideas were, were quite uh, consistent with the experience that led up to the uh, uh, formation or the Maastricht Treaty and the formation of, of uh, EMU. Has the compromise worked? Uh, it's uh, easy, of course, to say uh, initially, uh, if you look at, at uh, public finance sustainability, uh, the answer must be no, uh, because uh, we have uh, debt levels that are now on average 90% uh, plus uh, in uh, the euro area. Um, Greece is at 170 something. Um, Portugal and, and Italy seem stuck at about 132, 133, Belgium more than 100, uh, France, uh, at, uh, France and Spain in the high 90s. So the average is uh, something like uh, 90 uh, plus. It has become a club of highly indebted countries, uh, just contrary to what, uh, in a sense, the Germans had uh, decided. On the other side, we, we have to say that uh, the compromise worked very well in, in creating a truly independent and well-functioning central bank, the only federal institution that currently uh, uh, exists. And that was quite an achievement uh, given uh, what had uh, gone uh, before that. Uh, so uh, it's a mixed uh, picture, but uh, in a sense, uh, the, the German element of the compromise is further from being realized than the uh, than the French one of, of getting into monetary union and having a shared responsibility. The French, of course, exaggerated the role they would play in, in making a monetary policy because they would not be under political instruction, they would not be a government representative that did that, but an independent central bank from France as well. So, but should we be as concerned as, as we are and, and as critical of the environment uh, uh, I don't. I don't think so personally, but uh, I don't want to sound too uh, sanguine. Uh, some say uh, it was, in any case, a totally arbitrary level of, of public debt that was used as a reference or as a norm in the Maastricht Treaty and as a, a requirement for entering uh, uh, EMU 60%. Um, it was not totally arbitrary. It was uh, at a certain link with the uh, uh, deficit rule. Uh, but it was linked to the assumptions at the time that economies would grow by 5% uh, a year, then it would be uh, uh, quite easy, even if you were close to the 3% most of the time, to end up with the 60% uh, debt ratio. Now when the uh, growth rate is only 3 to 3.5%, three maybe at best 2% inflation, 1.5% on average uh, um, real growth, then uh, the uh, deficits uh, will, uh, if the deficit is still around 3% as it is in, in the Maastricht Treaty, then you would converge to about 100%. So that seems to be verified <coughs> by, the, um, uh, by the experience. So in that sense, the rules were too, too easy. But on the other hand, and maybe more importantly, uh, there is um, uh, there are some things that have made the system more stable, both the uh, safety mechanism that now exists uh, through the European stability mechanism and the efforts, of, not least and particularly, of the uh, ECB uh, in uh, uh, its uh, asset mark, uh, purchase program and earlier in its uh, willingness to give a conditional support to national uh, bond markets through its uh, OMT arrangements in 2012 that had never been uh, used because uh, no country has ever taken on the political commitments that would be required for that, but it has had clearly a major stabilizing influence on, on markets and it has worked extremely well. 
So um, as the IMF also is beginning to sound more and more openly, uh, maybe uh, higher debt levels are sustainable than 60% on average. Uh, they must be uh, individually assessed. They are clearly not the same, uh, not even within a more homogeneous areas such as, as Europe. But uh, there is no precise critical threshold at, at 60%, which still is the main basis in the European uh, uh, semester for assessing country performances, where, how far you are uh, from that. So where does that leave us? Uh, do we have a little bit more freedom of uh, maneuver? The Commission tried to uh, spill out. They had used uh, a lot of uh, flexibility uh, gradually introduced, not least at the instigation of large member states, um, to delay adjustment uh, to the 3% and, and to uh, now particularly the 60% the um, uh, debt ratio, where, where the a pace was finally prescribed in, in 2012. Uh, for the uh, acceptable pace uh, in a uh, satisfactory pace. So um, the, the Commission has used that flexibility uh, quite extensively, but uh, clearly uh, by last year it was not quite enough. Uh, so they proposed instead that under the heading of a euro area fiscal stance there should be some extra effort to bring the whole of the uh, fiscal policy stance in the euro area in better balance with monetary policy and to eliminate a bit more quickly the remaining slack in our economies. Did not get much support uh, uh, in the Eurogroup. Uh, there were one or two countries that spoke up in favor of it, but not more than that. Uh, it was seen as coming in a sense uh, too late in the upswing. The output gap was being too close to being eliminated. That is uh, disputable, as I said. But it looked a bit too much like the fine-tuning that most uh, governments think is outdated uh, in, uh, as a fiscal uh, strategy. And there was still the argument from the Maastricht days that uh, your uh, fiscal stance sits somewhat uneasily with nationally formulated uh, rules. How should one translate them into national recommendations and allocate them between countries? We now have uh, the Commission's latest forecast the spring uh, uh, 2017. It's just being digested. And we can see there that with no uh, policy changes, um, uh, there would be a uh, uh, deterioration of the, uh, uh, of the fiscal balance in the, uh, in the Union. Um, but uh, without the corrections, of course, that uh, countries are expected to do even within the flexible administration of the rules. If um, maximum flexibility is uh, administered, one would get almost to the neutral stance that is uh, um, uh, suggested as broadly appropriate also by uh, the, uh, the Eurogroup, but only if the countries that have some <coughs> fiscal space are overperforming use that fully in 2018. Now, these figures refer to 2018 now. So there would still be next year a need for that kind of action that removes the current asymmetry between the strong countries and the weaker countries. Um, now, um, France and Italy are particularly difficult uh, countries, Portugal uh, too, because uh, they have come to rely primarily on uh, uh, just observing the nominal principle of the 3% uh, deficit. Uh, Italy with a slight margin to it. Um, France apparently now, according to the latest forecast, getting slightly above 3% deficit in 2018. And that would indeed require, even in the case of German expansion, some uh, reaction. <clears throat> How that would be resolved, uh, I don't know. I think the, the Commission had difficulty uh, uh, coming out with even tentative recommendations for 2018. That would not be necessary at this point because it's only in the fall that uh, the definite recommendations will come out, but that will be the real, uh, I think, clash if um, uh, there is to be one. It passed more in uh, silence or without much discussion, also in public, uh, when a similar situation arose in, in the uh, summer of 2016. Some would say uh, it's too difficult to think of a, a rule of, for the fiscal stance that we could then allocate between countries. 
until there is more uh, of a federal system of public finances in the uh, euro area. And that's why, of course, uh, the Commission's reflections, extending what was in the report from the five presidents two years ago, uh, why that is awaited with some uh, interest, and it's due uh, to be exact on the 31st of, of May this year. Uh, that would be uh, a more focused paper than the very broad-ranging and rather vague uh, uh, white paper that the Commission published on a number of EU issues uh, in February this year. There are basically two uh, main options, I think, that will come out, and that's what one can assess from what has been said by Vice President Dombrovskis, who is the main person in the Commission responsible for this document. One is indeed the follow-up to the Federalist model of, of a more central capacity, but in what form, then? That is the next uh, question that raises. I'll come back to that very shortly and briefly. And secondly, and that would suit more the uh, point of view of the stronger countries, let us return a bit more towards the original ideas of uh, Maastricht. Let's complete the other things, a banking union, including also uh, deposit insurance, and let us then uh, re recognize that we cannot get any further with the rules and have some greater element of market discipline. <coughs> I uh, come in first on, on the first one of these uh, uh, models. Um, uh, <coughs> there again, there are uh, several possibilities of moving towards uh, central fiscal capacity. Uh, one would be uh, to enlarge uh, the so-called Juncker plan, to do it by borrowing and lending under the broad heading, uh, with some leverage uh, uh, through contributions from the private sector, some element of guarantees, as is in the Juncker plan. Um, secondly, uh, some countries, particularly Italy, favor the idea of an unemployment fund or an unemployment reinsurance fund. If some countries have a larger rise in unemployment than others, there should be temporary transfers to that country but that should be reversible uh, in the course of the business cycle. Uh, thirdly, there should be some allocation to a euro area budget uh, with an allocative and distributive function. The latter is, of course, the most radical, but it does have the particular interest that um, it seems to be uh, among the things that uh, the new French president has in mind, how the Germans will react to it, uh, I will not try to uh, predict at this point, but let me say one more thing about the, the two first ones. The borrowing and lending and extension of the Juncker plan is in a way uh, in the cards and would not require major uh, technical revisions. It is not very effective. The Juncker plan has not uh, been a great success in terms of bringing forth projects that would not have been realized anyway or are not ready for uh, being implemented anyway. So it's, uh, uh, it's an, the least controversial, the most politically feasible, but also probably the least effective. The unemployment fund is too difficult probably to design because it would at times lead to transfers between countries that were, in a sense, counterintuitive in terms of the justification you would give for them. Uh, Spain, with uh, now rapidly falling unemployment, but still at 17, 18% unemployment, would be transferring, for example, in the current phase to a number of northern European countries where unemployment is stable and low. So it's, it's a bit difficult to foresee and, and uh, to manage. It requires further standardization of labor market uh, practices. And it's uh, uh, therefore, I think, unlikely to be uh, implemented. So the, the, the choice is really between, I think, the more uh, simple one of, of uh, extending the Juncker plan, which is not very effective, or the radical longer term one that would really be um, uh, also for the long term in terms of agreeing on it. Then about the return to Maastricht that I mentioned as a, <coughs> a possibility favored still by uh, the Germans. Uh, I don't think that would be uh, certainly desirable uh, at the present time, given the differences in, in debt levels that we currently see. Uh, um, the interaction of the rules-based system and the market discipline has always been an uneasy one. At times, uh, the markets totally disregarded the building up of tensions inside the euro area. Then they reacted very strongly uh, during the crisis, uh, as I don't need to remind uh, 
this audience, uh, also with respect to Ireland, certainly to respect to several southern European countries. And um, subsequently, they have again, under the impression, not least of the ECB actions, uh, compressed the uh, margins between sovereign bonds very considerably. So um, uh, it's an unstable system, and uh, with uh, still uh, unresolved issues in the, in the banking sector and political risks, it would be very dangerous to move to, in my view, to uh, increase market discipline at an early stage until some more uh, ideas have been developed on how to consolidate the debt position of the more exposed uh, countries. So I think the, the former set of issues on the, the more federalist line are certainly the most uh, uh, satisfactory from an economic point of view, but also politically extremely difficult. So that goes well beyond my time horizon. Thank you very much.